Well, it's great to have so many of our college students home and so many um, family members from far and wide joining us. While you guys have been gone, we've been really examining what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. And um, we've come to define that as somebody who lives, loves, and leads like Jesus. And uh, in addition to that, we've been looking at the growth of the early Christian church. And so I'm going to try and sum that up pretty succinctly for you with a video from Bryce Kelly. So here you go. It's in slow-mo so you don't miss anything. Super slow-mo, evidently. All right, you're probably wondering, what in the world does that have to do with the early church? So let me explain this to you. So in the early church, it was all confined within Jerusalem, and the church was growing, and the Jewish authorities and the Roman authorities wanted to squash it. They wanted to smash it. They wanted to kill it. But what they discovered, as we did when you hit that big old jar of mayonnaise, instead of killing it, it just spread more and more, and it began to grow. And so what was true back then is even true today. We see it. You can't stop Christianity. You can't st stop the spread of the church. Um, look at places like China. They're trying to squash. They're trying to put the hammer down on the church. They're trying to kill the church. And what happens? It just spreads. It goes underground. It continues to grow. That's what we saw happening. That's what we continue to see happening even today. And so this morning, we're in Acts chapter 13, so if you want to open up your Bibles and follow along, that would be great. If you've got a church Bible, it's page 1091. And what we're going to see here is really the first official missionary journey of Barnabas and Saul, who from this point forward, we will know as Paul. So Saul will be better known as Paul from this point forward. And it all is, is set um, in Antioch, and Antioch is this city in the southeastern portion of what we know as modern-day Turkey. And so that's where it's taking place. Uh, so it's important. I think what we're going to see with, with Saul and with Barnabas is something that should be evident in the lives of all of us. If we are truly a disciple, if we really are followers of Jesus Christ, what we see happening in the lives of Saul and Barnabas should be happening in our lives as well. Five things we're going to see this morning. One was that they were set apart. Two, they were sent out. Three, they were sought after. Four, they were spirit-led. And then finally, five, they were successful. They were successful. So set apart, sent out, sought after, spirit-led, successful. So be watching as... as you read through this as you listen to these words. Try and see where that is true in your life. Try and look for the evidence of these things in your life, just like it was happening in the lives of Saul, who we'll know as Paul, and Barnabas. So let's begin with verse 1. It says, Now in the church at Antioch there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manian, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. Now the church in Antioch had, had become quite vibrant, and it was filled with a lot of just fabulous leaders, gifted leaders, men and women of different backgrounds, different ethnicities, and yet they had this common faith that united them. Now, God had great plans for them. He was growing the church there, but he wanted to use them for even greater purposes. He wanted to use them to go and plant other churches around the world. 
much like he's done here at Orchard Hills, right? He, he's used us to help plant other churches. And so we're going to see here that um, Barnabas and Paul specifically were set apart. They were set apart for this mission. Now, two weeks ago, we learned that it was there in Antioch that the followers of Jesus first became known as Christians. The first time they were called Christians was in Antioch. And we looked at the meaning of Christian, and we see that what it means is belonging to the anointed one. Belonging to the anointed one. In other words, a Christian is somebody who belongs to Jesus the Christ, the anointed one. And so if you are a Christian, then you are also an anointed one. To be anointed is to be set apart. So if you are a Christian, you have been set apart, just like Barnabas, just like Paul. You have been set apart. Um, now, once they were set apart, they were sent out, right? Remember, the church, the leaders, they all came around them. They laid hands on them, and they prayed for them. So they've been set apart, and then they were sent out. And it made me think about how we've done that around here. So when we've set apart and sent out some church planners, what have we traditionally done? We've had them come up, right? When folks are leaving the church, and we will have them come up, and we will lay hands on them, and we will pray over them, and we will send them out with our blessing and God's blessing. And it made me think that maybe we need to start doing this more and more because when you become a follower of Jesus, so when you commit your life to Jesus, you, in, in essence, become a missionary. You instantly become a missionary. You have been set apart. You have been set apart for a mission. You have been commissioned and commanded to go and make disciples of all nations. That's true of each and every one of us that are followers of Jesus Christ. If we are Christians, we have been anointed, we have been set apart for mission. And so it made me think, maybe we need to change this, even our baptism cer um, ceremony and our service. Maybe we need to, to really intentionally be laying hands on those folks and, and preparing them to go out because they've been set apart. We've all been called on mission. And so it begins at home. It begins where we've been planted. It begins with our family and our friends and our community. But then it should expand, just like the mayonnaise, right? We should continue to have influence far and wide. We're called to make disciples. We've been set apart. We've been sent out, just like Barnabas and Paul. Now, let's see what happens next in their lives. Look at verse 4. It said, The two of them, sent on their way by the Holy Spirit, went down to Seleucia and sailed from there to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. John was with them as their helper. They traveled through the whole island until they came to Paphos. All right, so let me show you this on a map, of course. So this is like Paul's first missionary journey. And right here, so this is the southeastern part of modern-day Turkey. That's Antioch. And then they came over here to Seleucia, and then they sailed down here to Salamis. And they landed on Cyprus. And then they made their way across the island, ultimately to Paphos, right here. Now, notice that it says when they landed on the island, what was the first thing that they did? We see that Paul and Barnabas, they go to the Jewish synagogue, which is interesting because we come to know Paul as the missionary to the Gentiles or the non-Jews. And yet he first goes to the Jewish synagogue and brings the word of God to them. And this happens to be a pattern in his life. You'll see it throughout the New Testament. As he goes to these new places, he begins by reaching out to the Jews. In Romans 1.16, he, he described himself this way. He said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. And so while he may have been the missionary, the primary missionary to the Gentile, he always went first to the Jews. Now, look at verse 6 with me. 
It said they traveled through the whole island until they came to Paphos. There they met a Jewish sorcerer and false prophet named Bar-Jesus, who was an attendant of the proconsul Sergius Paulus. The proconsul, an intelligent man, sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. He wanted to hear the word of God. So again, imagine they've landed on this island. And they're making their way through the island. Everywhere they're, they're going, they're, they're opening up the word of God and they're pointing to Jesus. All these prophecies, just like we're celebrating during this Advent season, we're looking at some of these prophecies of the Old Testament and how they point to Jesus, how he fulfills all these things. And they're opening up the word of God. And word is spreading. Well, it goes even before them. It gets to Paphos before they ever arrive there. And the proconsul, who is like the governor of the region, he hears about it. And, and this is an interesting area. So Paphos is like the, the capital of that region. And it's also, you guys remember Greek mythology? Remember Aphrodite? Well, this is the primary place where they worship the Greek goddess Aphrodite. And so that happens to be where the governor is. And he has gotten word about Barnabas and Paul. And he summons them. He seeks after them. And so that's what we see happening in the life of Barnabas and Paul, that they've been set apart, they've been sent out, and now they're being sought after. See, the governor, he wants an audience with them. He wants to hear more about the word of God. And um, listen to this in, in, in verse 7. I think this is really interesting. The proconsul, an intelligent man... So so they specifically say, an intelligent man sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. I think truly wise and intelligent people recognize just how little they know. Truly wise and intelligent people recognize just how little they know. And they have this desire to know more, to have greater understanding. And, And if they're really intellectually wise and honest... They will seek after the truth as found in the word of God. Because it's in the word of God that some of the mysteries that have perplexed mankind from the beginning of time are found. The answers are there in the word of God. And so if you you seek to understand why were we created, the answers in his word, the Bible. And that's what we see happening here. This very intelligent governor is seeking out knowledge from Barnabas and Saul because he knows they understand the word of the Lord. And I think it's important for us to remember too, Jesus said, like, if we really want greater understanding, if we want to know God, then all we have to do is seek. And guess what will happen? We'll find. He said, seek and you will find. Seek and you will find. And so if, if, if we're lacking in a relationship with God, if we're lacking in understanding, all we have to do is seek, and we will find. We will find. Now, what was true in those days is true today. Um, I think people are seeking answers. There, there are a lot of questions about, you know, who is God, and, and who are we, and how do we relate? And I believe that if you identify as a Christian, and there's some evidence in your life that you are living and loving and leading like Jesus, I believe others will seek you out. They will come to you and ask you questions about God and faith and his word. It's been true in in my life. Obviously, when when you're a pastor, you sort of expect people to seek you out and ask questions about God and faith and the Bible and things like that. But it happened... um, way before I I was ever a pastor. Once I committed my life to Christ and and became a true follower and there was evidence in my life, like people would look at my life and go, okay, something's different now. He is not the same person. And um, they saw, you know, maybe some glimpses of, of Jesus in my life. I found that they would seek me out and they'd come up to me at work. And so I wanted to be prepared when that happened. So I would keep a Bible 
not one as nice as this, but like a paperback Bible that you get for like a dollar, right? And uh, I would keep that in my desk at all times. And I had multiples of these. That way, if somebody came and they started asking me some questions, I could just pull out one of these Bibles and open it up and begin to show them some of the answers that they sought. And then I would give them that Bible and encourage them to take it and begin to read for themselves and start reading at, at Matthew and going forward and discover for themselves the mysteries of God, all the questions that we seek. They're found in the Word of God. I also kept, there's this uh, helpful kind of diagram, if you will, called the Romans Road to Salvation. Some of you guys may be familiar with it, but it, it just identifies some passages in the book of Romans that really point to our need for a relationship with God and then his answer, how he has fulfilled that need. And it's real easy because you don't have to be jumping around in your Bible from this book to that book because some of these books are hard to find, are they not? You know, and so you just find Romans and you're just right there and you can just take them through and you can explain to them this message of salvation. So I would keep that, I had shrunk that down so it would go in my day timer and everywhere I went, because I always went with, the day timer was probably with me more than the Bible, let's just be honest, you know, and everywhere I went with that day timer, I had the Romans road of salvation with me. So I was prepared because people will seek you out. If you are a follower of Jesus, just like Barnabas and Saul, they're going to seek you out. They want to know about the Lord. They're going to want to understand more about the Word of God. And so we need to be prepared. If you are truly a Christian, one that's anointed, set apart, if you are a follower of Jesus, you are a disciple, you need to know the Word of God. You need to be prepared to show people the answers that they seek. So, um, that's what we're seeing here. Now, let's continue on. People are seeking them out, specifically the governor. And when this is happening, the same is going to be true for us as it was for Barnabas and Saul. There will be opposition. There will be opposition. You should expect to face opposition. Listen to verse 8. But Elymas, the sorcerer for that is what his name means, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. So Elymas, also known as Bar-Jesus, I think he gave himself that name. So he was a sorcerer. He could do really magical, mystical things. And he was also a false prophet. And so he used these abilities to really manipulate people, he used them to produce a livelihood for himself. That's how he earned his living, by distorting the truth of God. And so he opposed Barnabas and Saul. He was opposed to the word of God because the word of God is going to do what? It's going to expose him for the fraud that he was. See, this prophet, this false prophet was profiting off of the word of God but he was distorting it. He was twisting it. And so he wanted to keep the governor from becoming a follower of Jesus. He wanted to keep the word of God out of the governor's hands because he knew that when the truth was made known, he'd be out of a job. There's opposition. There's opposition to the word of God and there's opposition to those who bring it. What was true then is true today. Think about it for a minute. Those involved in the multi-billion dollar pornography industry are opposed to the word of God and opposed to those who bring it. Those involved in the abortion industry are opposed to the word of God and opposed to those who bring it. Those who are involved in the self-help industry, they're opposed to the word of God and they're opposed to those who bring it. Think about this, how you see this unfold in your life. Um, those who are involved in self-indulgent lifestyles, they're opposed to the word of God, and they're opposed to those who bring it. Those who, who think they're intellectually superior to others, they're opposed to the word of God, and they're opposed to those who bring it. 
you'll see this pattern. They're opposed to, this, to the truth. And if that's not enough, Satan, the devil, is opposed to the word of God. And he's opposed to those who bring it. And so if you've been set apart, if you've been sent out, if you've been sought after, then there's going to be opposition. There's going to be opposition, and you need to be prepared for it. You need to be prepared for it. Now let's look at verse 9. This is this interesting transition that I've alluded to. It said, Then Saul, who was called Paul. So I want, want to pause there for a moment, because a lot of times there's confusion over this. Why did he go from being called Saul to being called Paul? And there's different theories on this that you can read about. I would encourage you to, to just discuss it a little bit more. But here's what I believe is happening here. So Saul was his Hebrew name. He was raised as a Hebrew. He became a leader among Hebrews. He went by the name Saul. That was his Hebrew name. But remember, he becomes the missionary to the Gentiles who are primarily Greek. Greek. So instead of using his Hebrew name, Saul, he goes by his Greek name, which is Paul. It's really not all that complicated. All right. I believe what he wanted to do was eliminate any barriers to them being able to receive him and ultimately to receive the word of God and to receive Jesus Christ. And so if he's coming to these Gentile folks, these Greek folks, and he's coming with his Hebrew name, well, that could be an obstacle. It could be a barrier. But he came, if he came as one of them, as Paul, I think they might be more apt to welcome him in as one of their own. And I think simply, that's the change. He goes from being Saul to Paul. Simply that. Ponder that. Talk about that later. In the meantime, we're getting back to business here. So verse 9 again. Then Saul, who was called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit. This is what I want you to see. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. Looked straight at Elymas. Straight at Elymas and said, You are a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is right. You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Will you never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? Now the hand of the Lord is against you. You are going to be blind for a time, not even able to see the light of the sun. And immediately mist and darkness came over him, and he groped about seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Quite an interaction between Paul and this sorcerer or false prophet. We see here that while Paul has been, again, set apart, sent out, sought after, he's also led by the Spirit. He is Spirit-led. It says he was full of the Holy Spirit. He was full of the Holy Spirit. This is a pattern that we've seen as we've been going through Acts, have we not? Remember Barnabas? What was he? He was full of the Holy Spirit. He was full of the Holy Spirit. And so we see the Holy Spirit at work throughout the life of, of, of Paul here. If you go back, remember when he was set apart? Who did the setting apart? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit said set apart Paul and Barnabas. Who did the sending out? The Holy Spirit sent out Paul and Barnabas. Who gives them insight? Who gives them the power to do, to pronounce, to see through the darkness, to see through the lies and the deceit of this false prophet? The Holy Spirit does. Who gives them the power to blind this guy for a time? The Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit enables Paul to do what only God can do. He was led by the Spirit, and he was obedient to the Spirit. Now, I, I think, again, if you've got some time, this is great light, lunchtime kind of discussion, but look at some of the similarities between Elymas, 
Bar Jesus, as he liked to be called, this false prophet and sorcerer, and the apostle Paul, who we know him. Look at how similar they were. Look at how they tried to keep people in the darkness. They wanted to keep the truth about God away from others, right? They persecuted others. Look at how they were both physically blinded. So it investigate some of that. It's, it's really pretty interesting to look at the similarities. And who knows? History tells us, there, there's some historians that say that um, this guy actually turned and became a follower of Jesus as well. So do a little study. Ponder that a little bit. But it's quite, pretty interesting to, to look at the similarities here. So, finally, we see success. We see success in verse 12. It says, When the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed. For he was amazed at the teaching about the Lord. So the proconsul, the governor, when he saw what was happening, he believed. He became a follower of Jesus. And here's what I think is really important to notice. It wasn't, it wasn't the fact that, that Paul was able to blind this sorcerer, this false prophet. He, he wasn't impressed by his magical tricks, if you will. No, what was he amazed by? He was amazed by the teaching about the Lord. It, it wasn't that Paul made this man blind for a time. No, he was amazed by the teaching of the Lord. He was amazed by the word of God. Remember, he was an intelligent man, and he is amazed as Barnabas and Paul open up the words of Scripture and it just begins to come alive to him. You see, true success only comes through the power of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. If you want to have lasting success, it has to come about because of the power of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. You could be a, an incredibly eloquent speaker or a dynamic leader. But whatever success you experience will only be temporary unless it comes about through the power of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. That's the only kind of lasting success there is. And here's the interesting thing. So God's going to determine what success looks like for each and every one of us. Okay, he's going to be the one that determines what success looks like for each and every one of us. And it, it may be that... that um, for you, it's to make one disciple, one disciple, one follower of Jesus, one person who better understands and embodies what it is to live and love and lead like Jesus. Maybe that's what he's calling you to. Maybe he's calling you to impact tens or hundreds or even thousands of people. It doesn't matter how many. What determines your success is how obediently you follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. That's the key to success. How obediently do you follow the leading of the Holy Spirit? That will determine whether you're successful or not. Just like Barnabas, just like Paul. If you are a disciple, you're just like them. If you are a Christian, you're just like them. You have been set apart. You have been sent out. You should be sought after. People should be seeking after you, seeking the wisdom that you have, which is found in the word of God. You should be spirit-led, going where he leads you to go, saying what he leads you to say. This isn't something you've got to do on your own. Now, the, the beauty of it, the success is found in your obedience to the leading of the Holy Spirit. It's not something you have to work at. You just have to obey and follow. And that's where success is found. So are you a Christian? Are those things true of you? If you are, if you've been sent out, ask yourself, who have I been sent to and where have I been sent? Who have I been sent to and where have I been sent? And then take some time and evaluate, have you been successful in life? Have you been successful in life? How are you doing at making disciples? Because that's the common call. 
Go and make disciples. Go and make disciples. How are you doing that? Are you being led by the Spirit? Again, it's not a matter of how many. It's about obedience. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for examples like, like Paul and, and Barnabas. We thank you that even when um, others try to, to squash the church, to kill the church, they will never be successful. It will just continue to spread and grow. Lord, we thank you that, that we are, are special. Lord, we thank you that we've been set apart. If we are Christians, if we are truly Christians, we have been set apart. What a special honor that is. What a privilege that is. And if we've been set apart, we've been sent out. And if we've been sent out, others are going to seek after what we have. And we pray that we would be led by your spirit and that we would experience success as you determine it to be. So speak to us, Lord. Lead us. Thank you for choosing us and using us. In Jesus' name, amen.